So hello, and thanks for the chance to give this presentation. Um, my name is Timothy Wangler. I am representing ETH Zurich, the Institute for Building Materials, uh, and specifically the Chair of Physical Chemistry of Building Materials, which is headed by Professor Robert Flatt. And I'm also here representing the National Center for Competence and Research on Digital Fabrication and Architecture, uh, all from ETH Zurich, of course. Um, this NCCR is a 12-year funding initiative from the Swiss National Science Foundation, uh, as the name suggests, aimed at uh, promoting, uh, researching and promoting dig digital fabrication technologies in architecture. Uh, and we're in the last four years of this initiative. Uh, anyway, what I'm here to talk to you about today is sustainability and processing challenges in digital fabrication with concrete, and specifically on a couple of papers which were presented in the Digital Concrete Conference uh, from Ryland, which took place about uh, six months ago in, uh, in Loughborough in England. Um, and I'll touch on both of these papers uh, and uh, and link them together uh, somehow as well throughout this entire presentation. Um, the first one on sustainability was uh, written by Professor Flat and myself, and the second one was written by myself. It's on processing, um, and it was co-authored by uh, Rafael Pileggi, who's at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, as well as Shane Maguro, who's a PhD student within our group. Here at ETH Zurich uh, and uh, Professor Flat. So <clears throat> I typically start my presentations with this collage, and of course I ran out of uh, space on this collage in 2019 uh, because the field had advanced uh, so much. There are uh, we're at the point where these large-scale demonstrations are seemingly pretty commonplace, and we're starting to see 3D printed buildings uh, uh, being printed on on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so uh, this, this is indicative of really how far the field has advanced, how far we have come. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that we uh, that there aren't challenges. And uh, I think the top one, of course, is uh, having to do with reinforcement. There is no really automated reinforcement strategy. And so I think this is probably the biggest challenge facing the field. However, uh, it's not the topic of this talk. There are many other people that are researching this topic. And, uh, and even if they don't find an answer, it seems that even without this, uh, the 3D printing of unreinforced concrete is still uh, viable, uh, as, as you'll see. Um, but this, uh, this paper is motivated, or these, this presentation, I should say, and these papers were motivated by a couple of statements. The first one being, that our mixes are mostly not sustainable with respect to embodied con carbon. I think this is uh, not a very controversial statement. Uh, many people are already researching how to get embodied carbon down in digital concrete mixes. Uh, so uh, this motivated one paper. And uh, the motivation behind another paper uh, is was this statement that there has not yet been a building site structure printed in one go within 24 hours, despite claims to the contrary. Uh, and still, even now, I don't believe that it has happened, although I do think that uh, that we are capable of it. Uh, it does seem to be a fairly problematic thing uh, within the field. Anyway, this, these are what motivated these papers, and I'll go into them into these statements uh, one by one. Uh, but before that, uh, let's set the stage by uh, referencing a paper that was presented also in the Digital Concrete Conference. This paper was presented by some authors in the Rylum Technical Committee on Digital Fabrication with Concrete or Cementitious Materials, which uh, finished uh, just uh, earlier this year, I believe. Um, and uh, these authors took a look at eight recent case studies. They wanted to know how how uh, additive manufactured concrete is actually being used. With these case studies, they found that actually it's still primarily demonstrations, although I think that has changed somewhat in recent, uh, in recent months and years. Um, they quote that uh, the printed concrete is rarely used structurally, uh, and the reasons they give is lack of regulatory frameworks, although this problem is actually being addressed and there are standards that are 
uh, in motion and in place, very rapidly moving. Uh, and then the other uh, the other thing is the lack of suitable reinforcement, which I touched on earlier. Uh, as a result of this, um, often unreinforced masonry analogies are often applied. What that means is that 3D concrete printing is used to print lost formworks and unreinforced masonry. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, uh, for example, this is the famous uh, 3D printed uh, uh, building, the large one in uh, Dubai by Apis Core. Uh, and you can see basically the general uh, 3D printed building product that they are, uh, uh, that is being promoted primarily, which is a 3D printed unreinforced masonry wall. Uh, and then voids printed where reinforcement is placed and structural concrete is subsequently cast. You can also see it up here. Uh, this is from a Kobod print, I believe. Um, I also need to make the distinction between 1K and 2K systems. This is done in that second paper that I referenced on uh, chemical process engineering and digital concrete. Um, in that paper, we define the difference between 1K and 2K. The K stands for component. It comes from the German word component, and it's commonly used uh, nomenclature in the in the coatings industry, and that's why we, we adopt it here. Um, the main difference between these two uh, types of systems is that in the 1K system, we don't uh, we, we basically mix the concrete, send it to the printhead and print. In the 2K system, we have acceleration at the printhead, where we add an accelerator at the printhead to the concrete uh, and then print. And it's, it will allow us to print more rapidly, as I'll, as I'll note later. Um, uh, it's also worth pointing out that there, uh, this is an error in the published version of the paper, or there is in this figure, and I apologize for that. It was introduced during the proofing process. Um, now I'll talk about uh, just generally strength developed in cementitious materials. Uh, when you uh, when you mix water and cement, uh, I mean the reason why we use it is because it eventually uh, it's it's fluid for some time, and then eventually it, it gains uh, it hardens and gains structural strength. In that period, that time where it's fluid, it can actually build strength. It builds strength through so uh, through uh, primarily uh, we call it uh, thixotropic processes. Uh, where uh, it's actually coming from flocculation and low-level hydration between cement grains uh, before it reaches the limit, and then eventually it has to wait for the onset of the accelerator. This limit is, uh, by the way, around half a meter to three-quarters of a meter, very typically, although that can be increased with certain uh, chemical admixtures, probably. Um, and then eventually, if you exceed that limit, uh, you end up with a collapse like you see here. Which means that uh, without any kind of set control where you rely on chemical hydration processes, uh, you won't be able to build much higher than this limitation. And then how do we achieve that set control? It can be done, and as stated here, it's for two component systems. You, you need to understand how hydration processes proceed for that to occur. Um, and taking this old figure from uh, Marchon, we can see that uh, when you add clinker faces and uh, well, cement, the uh, mineral phases in cement, which includes sulfatic phases. Here we have hemihydrate, but it's typically gypsum. Um, and then the clinker phases in uh, tricalcium silicate and tricalcium aluminate added to water. These clinker phases dissolve. They form ions in solution, and then they uh, re-precipitate. They precipitate as hydrates, so they combine with water and form hydrates. The hydrates that form are typically either calcium silicate hydrate and Portlandite from the silicate phases, these are the main uh, calcium silicate hydrate is, of course, the main strength giving phase in cement, uh, in cementation systems. And then we also have minor phases such as uh, etringite that form from the illuminate phases. So you can play on this uh, set control uh, by playing on the silicates by adding calcium nitrate or seeds, which will then, of course, uh, spur the growth of more CSH, calcium silicate hydrate. Uh, and we've done that in a few of our systems, uh, but uh, you can also do it by playing on the illuminates. Uh, calcium illuminate cement or calcium sulfate combined with calcium sulfate or aluminum sulfate solutions. 
to form etringite, you know, the minor phase. And uh, I'll get deeper into this uh, later in the presentation. Uh, yes, and of course we've done, and not just us, but others have done this uh, as well. Okay, so I wanna get into sustainability first on this paper. And in this paper, uh, we state that the environmental impact of a concrete structure and looking at it purely from the standpoint of embodied carbon uh, per year of service is directly proportional to the embedded carbon per unit volume times the total volume of the concrete component that you make and inversely proportional to the service life, which means that uh, the environmental impact can be decreased by looking at low clinker and alternative binders and reducing the paste volume, especially uh, for this part of it, uh, the material footprint, let's say, embedded CO2 per unit volume. From the standpoint of total volume, you can use primarily structurally informed shapes, uh, also looking at reducing waste and looking at reusability. And then finally, the service life, of course, has to do with the durability. So increase the durability, increase the service life, uh, as well as looking at design for reuse. Uh, but uh, the dominant ways to control each of these are especially here, low clinical and alternative binders and paste volume reduction and structurally informed shapes for the total volume and durability, especially for the service life. Uh, the question that we wanted to ask in this paper is what does digital fabrication with concrete uniquely bring to the table? That's the key word, uniquely. Uh, and we state that it's this, it attacks specifically this part of this relationship at the total volume. And if you look at the, um, the rib slab system of uh, Pierluigi Nerfi, um, we can see that looking at this, really that shape efficiency is the only unique sustainability benefit that's offered by digital fabrication. And why? Because any per unit mass reduction in CO2 for a digital concrete can actually be done also for a standard concrete. So you have to look at what digital fabrication brings uniquely. And, uh, and from what we can see, the shape efficiency is the only unique sustainability benefit offered by digital fabrication. Um, there are, of course, other societal benefits. We can see that we get an increase in, in productivity, which is actually what is driving the adoption of these systems. It's specifically really the skilled labor shortage, which is driving economically the adoption of these systems. But let's please not forget the importance of sustainability in all this. Um, uh, so maybe there is a trade-off there that we have to evaluate, but still, I, I believe that, and we believe that we should still do as much as possible to improve our digital concrete on the material level. So what does that mean? That means if we take a look at this relationship and look at how we can Im uh, impact digital concretes from this perspective, which is, of course, already being done for others, uh, we have to look at what we can do. And specifically, the first thing we can do is to look at our digital concretes and see that compared to normal concretes, this table is taken from the paper, the OPC contents or the Portland uh, cement contents in standard concretes is much lower than the digital concretes. But whenever there is a digital concrete uh, that is on the level of the Portland uh, or, or the normal concretes or standard concretes, it's for one of two reasons. It's either because there's a high level of substitution uh, or there is a high uh, course or there's a high DMAX. You know, there's a, uh, the use of coarse aggregates, which allows greater packing density uh, and thus a lower paste volume. So in terms of reducing CO2 per unit material, after looking at that table, of course, this is already a big field of study for concrete in general, uh, but as I stated, it can and should be applied to digital concretes. It means that as a general rule, we just want to reduce clinker CO2 uh, contribution. We can do that many different ways, as I, uh, as I kind of alluded to in the previous slide. We can do it through substitutions. Of course, that can lead to potential problems with strength development and chemical admixtures. We can reduce paste content, which means the use of coarse aggregates, as I noted, uh, that can lead to potential problems in processing. We can use recycled materials, uh, but 
There are, of course, all the normal potential problems with recycled uh, materials, specifically recycled aggregates uh, that, that can arise. And then there's the use of alternative binders. And these have the similar issues as breaking into the mainstream of concrete as well. So in the paper, one of the things that, uh, that Robert and I note is that one of the things we noticed was that, uh, of course, concrete masonry units are essentially what are being 3D printed. You'll recall that from the earlier slide. And if you compare the standard water to binder ratio for a concrete masonry unit and compare it to the water to binder ratios for digital concretes, there's a huge difference between the two. Uh, and we state that it's because we're using a low water to binder ratio in order to increase the buildability of these uh, digital concretes. Uh, specifically, if we take a look at the strength development uh, curve or strength versus time curve, we know that there are three important strength scales. There's the layer strength, which is on the order of 10 seconds to uh, tens to hundreds of seconds or, uh, or tens to hundreds, sorry, of Pascal. Um, this is the strength that's needed for the, uh, for the layer to stand. Then we have the building strength or the component strength. This is to the tens of hundreds of kilopascal. So this is the strength required for production for the material or the component to stand on its own. And then we have the design strength. This is on the order of tens of megapascal. Uh, this is the hardened strength of the concrete. A couple of time scales that matter are production time and the construction time scale. Production time is the component production time scale. The construction time scale is that on the order of days. And for ordinary concrete, uh, you want to have your concrete in place by the end of the open time, basically. So about uh, three hours, two to three hours, typically, you want it in place at least by. Um, and then it eventually grows in strength over the days to its design strength. Uh, we typically add a retarder because we want to extend the open time so that we can work with it longer uh, for, uh, for digital concrete processes. And then after or when it's placed, we add an accelerator. And prior to, uh, to recently, we were working, of course, with uh, primarily silicate. Uh, we thought that we have to accelerate the main strength giving phase of concrete. Uh, so we accelerate the silicate phase uh, to allow us to develop production or building strength during the production time in, the, uh, in our bottommost layers. However, that doesn't help when it comes to the development of layer strength. You need still a little bit of strength to be able to stack layers on top of each other. And that means then uh, what has been typically done until now is to lower the water to binder ratio. You, people looking for ways to boost their thixotropy. Uh, and one of the easiest ways is to lower the water to binder ratio. That way the interparticle forces are stronger. You get more flocculation uh, and uh, with more cement, you get a little bit more of that low level hydration as well. Um, and that ultimately leads to an unnecessary overdesign in the strength uh, at, uh, uh, during the service life of the component that you're making. So it's like a trade-off between getting a process to work and wasting cement in the long run. So what we, uh, what we discuss in the paper is the so-called illuminate boosted concrete, where we boost the illuminate phases for production strength. And that allows us essentially to decouple the uh, production strength from the service strength. And so by decoupling design strength, from buildability strength, Basically, what this allows us to do is reduce clinker and allow for buildability. And it doesn't just allow that. It also allows more important things like cantilevering. Uh, it's very difficult to get cantilevering without rapid strength build, build up. And that's another thing that 2K, um, 2K systems get you. And so when it comes to set control for 2K systems, uh, what this essentially is doing, this decoupling is decoupling the design strength from the buildability or production strength. You're using the silicates for design strength. You're using the illuminates primarily for buildability or production strength. And we've done that primarily through the use of calcium illuminate cement, calcium sulfate systems, 
uh, by these two fellows here, primarily Lex, Dr. Lex Ryder and Dr. Arnesh Das. Uh, and by increasing calcium aluminate cement contents, you can see that there's an increase in the aluminate activity, which it increases the buildability. We have also found that these work well and are very robust in low clinker systems. In this recent paper, uh, with a 50% substituted um, uh, cement or, uh, concrete mixture, actually mortar mixture for printing, uh, we managed to successfully print uh, at, a, at, a, at a very high, let's say, production rate. Uh, so what are the advant advantages that you can gain from this? It allows robust acceleration of low clinker content cements. Uh, and as I mentioned, it also enables more shape freedom, cantilevering, which is, uh, again, I really want to drive that point home. It's the only unique digital fabrication sustainability benefit in uh, digital concretes. So are there potential disadvantages? This is a worthy question to ask. And the answer maybe lies here in durability. How are we doing on durability? And the early reports are really not encouraging, at least from the, uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of certain studies. I will say there's still a lot of work to be done, I think, here. With respect to durability, uh, our first look at it from the standpoint of carbonation on a 2K system, we took a 3D printed concrete, exposed it to an accelerated carbonation condition. And we found, as you can see here, rapid carbonation coming from the interfaces. So the interfaces are more permeable. Uh, so uh, for those who aren't familiar, the, the pink parts are the uncarbonated parts. The non-pink parts are the carbonated parts. And clearly, it's happening fast and rapidly. And when we actually compare this to a, uh, to a similar material but cast, it's no question. It's uh, 10 to 20 times faster. Uh, and uh, at this interface, we see a very thick layer of uh, carbonation products. So we see preferential transport at the interfaces. And some recent work from, uh, from uh, van der Putten et al. from the University of Ghent uh, also sees this similar thing with 1K systems, where they actually can observe increased carbonation with increased layer time intervals. So uh, there is, uh, uh, there's a lot of questions to be answered with respect to 3D printed concretes and their durability. Now let's take a look at another durability uh, metric, freeze thaw. We did some experiments. So uh, Arnish Das did some experiments in the lab uh, with looking at printed samples and cast samples, cycling them using ASTM, uh, using the ASTM procedure. And he saw by monitoring the mass loss that the Printed samples lost mass starting even around 100 cycles, and cast samples with the same material were undamaged. Uh, and we see similar types of damage potentially also in the field. We've had a couple of, or we've had uh, several 3D printed columns exposed for a few years now. And within the first year, we already saw significant damage. Again, permeability in the interfaces, looking at moisture transport, uh, neutron experiments, the layer time interval between these uh, two, this was a 2K printed sample, layer time interval, five minutes, and also with a cold joint. Uh, and we see along the interface more rapid uh, moisture ingress, which has also uh, been, so this is coming from increased permeability. This has also been confirmed uh, by studies using uh, uh, 3D printed concrete, shorter layer time intervals don't see this uh, increased moisture ingress, but with a 24 hour cold joint uh, at this, for this particular mix, we do see more rapid moisture ingress. And this also corresponds to chloride ingress as seen here. Along the lines of chloride transport, again, a study from Ghent, we see printed concretes with more rapid chloride ingress, then cast concrete, similarly, uh, uh, similar materials, but cast. And then there is the question of drying shrink or plastic shrinkage and drying shrinkage, which is being investigated by many, many folks. It's also be a, a major part of the Ryland Technical Committee on hardened properties of uh, digitally fabricated concrete. In this study uh, from Molik and, and authors, um, 
they looked at plastic shrinkage uh, and for drying shrinkage uh, long term and exposed columns again we see something that we attribute to a lot of vertical cracking that we attribute to drying shrinkage in our printed columns uh, it's worth noting of course that coarse aggregates i think will help a lot with uh, with respect to reduction of of uh, of shrinkage so where do we stand on all this? Uh, it's clear that in embedded CO2 per unit material, we are pretty bad. Uh, it seems that for the second part, for total volume, the where we get the unique benefit of digital fabrication, it's uh, we're good, but it's not really strongly incentivized. I still see a lot of 3D printed vertical walls and not a lot of curvature there. Um, and it's it's the curvature where, where, where we will really get our material savings within the curvature and design uh, of these uh, of these structures, although I do think 2K systems will help a lot to to get us to that point. And then finally for durability, uh, well, it doesn't really look good, but I think we do need some more research for that. Um, so the net result of this first half of the presentation has to do with 2K systems, you know, why we need them. I think we, it, as I noted, it helps us to get uh, more curvature in our uh, structures. We need coarse aggregates, and we do need an understanding of the process's impact on durability, which brings me now to processing and the importance of processing and understanding processing for digital concretes. And that's that was the focus of this paper. As I mentioned, the, the statement that drove the writing of this paper had to do with 24-hour prints of buildings at large scale. And uh, if we look at two buildings recently printed, one the Camp Say building printed with a Cobot printer and another one, uh, large military barracks printed by Icon, we can see clearly that there's an interface where printing paused and then they started again. So we're still not printing buildings in one go we, uh, in uh, within 24 hours. And there's, uh, uh, there's, there's a number of reasons for that, but uh, uh, we suspect that one of the reasons is the development of strength and controlling the development of strength where we think that 2K systems will, uh, will help us a lot. So in this paper, we looked at uh, chemical engineering concepts and applied them to digital concrete. And in chemical engineering, you split things into a series of unit operations. And it's the same thing with digital concretes, with 1K and 2K systems, uh, where every processing step, uh, all of these unit operations has a residence time and a residence time distribution. This factors in very strongly, very importantly, in this uh, understanding. So what is a residence time distribution? Well, if you take any volume, uh, and I have here for the example of plug flow systems, but let's just take any volume, and you have concrete flowing in at Q and concrete flowing out. Concrete, of course, is incompressible, so Q in and Q out are the same. The mean residence time, or the average amount of time that a fluid particle spends in this volume is simply the volume divided by the flow rate. <clears throat> so in a plug flow system, everything moves at the same velocity. So packet fluid packet number one and fluid packet number two move through at exactly the same speeds, meaning that they have identical residence times. So their residence times are identical to the mean residence time. Now, let's change the flow distribution inside this volume. Let's make it a, a laminar flow system, and let's say that this volume is a cylindrical pipe. Uh, so it's the same volume, but it has a flow distribution like you see here. And in this case, again, our mean residence time still is the volume divided by Q. However, fluid towards the center line will come out faster than fluid closer to the wall because the wall has the no slip boundary condition. So what that means then is that fluid packet number one is spending less time inside this volume than fluid packet number two. And in a continuous stirred tank, uh, again, the same concept, same residence time, mean residence time, but fluid packet number one goes in and immediately shoots out and then fluid number two might spend a little bit more time and then come out again. There's a difference in residence times. And this can be quantified with something called a washout function, which is the, let's say it's uh, equal to the average amount 
of time relative to the residence time by a fluid packet spent inside the volume. And for plug flow systems or batch systems seen here, it follows a heavy side step distribution where everything comes out at the residence time. Laminar flow systems at about halfway, the halfway point of the residence time, material starts to trickle out. Uh, and you can see that even at uh, you know double the residence time, a few percent of your material is still inside the, uh, the volume uh, and even up to three times your residence time. And then it continuously stirred, Mater material immediately starts coming out uh, and it's a, uh, it's a slower progression where even at three times the residence time, you still have a few percent of material inside your volume. And why does that matter? It matters because it leads to variations in material age throughout different processing stages. And this is extremely important in a reactive and rheologically changing material, specifically in a hardening material. Because if material stays, if, if it hardens while it's in any volume that it's not supposed to be in, this is obviously going to lead to processing problems. So when we take a look at, uh, uh, with this background in mind, and then when we take a look at the various uh, types of systems that were available on the market at the time that we were writing this paper, uh, we took a note of a few things, looking at larger print areas, uh, and we see that large area systems are by and large 1K systems uh, and lacked the ability, or at least didn't demonstrate yet, the ability of continuous printing above a, a couple of meters. Uh, so these large scale systems seem, were seemingly incapable of that. Also, we saw that 2K systems, which were capable of that, typically, for the most part, uh, didn't show uh, a high Dmax, didn't, weren't done with coarse aggregates. So uh, we identified that in general, large areas and continuous vertical printing, as well as coarse aggregates, have not yet uh, been realized. But, however, as you can see here, so both SIBI and the NTU system managed to successfully print continuously and vertically. So that led to the question then, like, maybe it's possible uh, to do this on the larger scale, which leads me to the concept of residence time management. So when you take a 1K system and you split it up into all of its important steps, like I uh, mentioned earlier, you have mixed proportioning, then you mix uh, the primary mixing step where you mix the cement with the water, there's often the storage step, and then a transport step, which is typically pumping. Uh, sometimes there's a second storage step because a hopper uh, is used, uh, for example, in the cobot system right before placement or application. Then sometimes there's finishing uh, a curing step, uh, which is uh, either uh, we used it to denote strength buildup during production uh, before reaching a self supporting 3D printed and, uh, material. And the important point to note is that during primary mixing, when you add water to cement, the clock immediately starts you start going towards the end of your open time. And you have first a residence time in the mixing step. You have another residence time in the storage step. You have another residence time during the pumping step. You have another residence time during the second storage step. Another residence time during application step. Uh, so it leads to the question, what if all of the sum of these residence times was equal to the open time? In other words, could we continuously print uh, and get a material that starts to harden the moment it comes out of the extruder in the application step uh, so that we could maybe do this kind of continuous vertical printing with a 1K system? So can we actually print a building in one go by just managing our residence times? Uh, and if we take a look at, uh, at this, uh, it means then that, so th this, is a, uh, this is a variation on, uh, on the plot that we saw earlier, but it involves the introduction of this step here, uh, the sum of the residence times before placement. So this point here uh, is the extrusion point. And so what we find is that then uh, from this analysis in the paper is that the maximum vertical building rate 
can be linked not necessarily to your thixotropic buildup, of course, but rather to the, the buildup rate uh, where the, your open time ends and the onset of the acceleration period begins. So when I, I won't go into the details of this analysis, it's in the paper, but according to our plastic collapse failure criterion, if we start building strength at a certain point and we look at uh, and we look at the currently available printing solutions that we have, we actually don't need a 2K system for large areas of uh, printing. So the question is that maybe buckling failure is perhaps forcing the processing pauses, or there could be another reason for it. The uh, equipment is just not able to sustain uh, properly printing for that long periods of time. But whatever the case, uh, it's clear that managing residence times is the key to successful and continuous vertical printing. So for residence time management, in a 1K system, it involves managing several residence times. For a 2K system, essentially, you remove all of those important residence time and residence time distributions and res uh, uh, resolve it just to one because you typically add a retarder or you have a very extended open time for your material before it gets to the printhead, and then you end the retardation through the addition of the accelerator. So in 1K systems, all these different residence times and the most problematic ones, according to uh, what I've seen and discussions with, uh, with industry folks, is especially the storage step where material sticks to the sides of the hopper uh, before going into the pump uh, and also in the pumping step as well. This is where you typically tend to get these kinds of, uh, of uh, concrete buildups and stoppages. Um, of course, there are engineering fixes for that, but this is also an advantageous fix is to remove these as problems and resign everything to one, say, complex uh, uh, problem at the printhead. It's just simply easier to manage one RTD rather than several RTDs, and especially when you start scaling things up. I want to emphasize that. So what that means then is how, if you want a 2K system, that means you need to have a printhead mixer or a reactor. And a question that I got often was, how do I size my reactor? So in a active mixing reactor, again, this is primarily active mixers we're talking about here. I know that static mixing uh, systems are being developed. We have a motor, we have a vessel, a reaction vessel and concrete going in and concrete coming out. This motor is turning an impeller, which is uh, causing your, uh, your material to mix. So the residence time, of course, is the volume of this uh, vessel divided by the flow rate. We have to define a blending time. That's essentially the amount of time for a homogeneous mix to be produced. This is uh, a, there's a certain number of turns of the impeller that is needed. It's called a homogenization number. And then you divide that by your speed and that's how long your impeller speed. So it's your rotational speed here. Uh, and that's how long it takes for a material to be homogeneously blended. And then we define also an activation time. And an activation time is essentially the amount of time that your material can stay inside the, uh, the amount of time that your material can, after mixing, is still processable, let's say. So at some point, you build up too much strength and your material is no longer processable. And clearly, your residence time has to lie somewhere between these two. The, the easier way uh, and of course, when you put it, it, these parameters into this equation, this is what you get for the volume of your reactor. Uh, the easy way to put it is to state that it needs to be big enough for proper mixing, but also not too big, or it will harden. If it's big, it, it needs to be big enough to allow enough turns of the impeller to mix properly. But if it's too big, then material stays in the resident or in the volume too long, and it starts hardening. Some general considerations, uh, especially looking at the strength curve after you add the accelerator, um, is uh, what you can do about the blend time is it's dependent on the speed, of course, as you could see, but it's also dependent on the Reynolds number, the mixing Reynolds number, and the geometry. 
are mixing Reynolds numbers defined here as the density times the square of the diameter. So that's our length scale times the speed. So you see a velocity, you see a length scale, you see a density, and like just like in any Reynolds number, as well as the viscosity. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's dependent on the impeller and reactor geometry. The activation time is for silicates. We have seen that it's in the uh, range of about uh, 20 minutes or more. We can't get it to go much faster than that, it seems. Uh, and with illuminates, this happens actually within seconds to minutes, which is what makes it so uh, attractive, of course, for rapid uh, for for rapid building technologies like shotcrete, uh, as well as 3D printing. Uh, so, uh, what then do we talk? Uh, what then about scale up? So, what do you need to consider in active mix or scale up? Is that at larger areas, we need faster print velocities typically and increased flow rates. Uh, and we also want to use coarse aggregates, which means larger equipment dimensions. And when it comes to uh, scale up, I'll allow Professor Martin Steinbuck, who during Digital Concrete 2020 uh, gave the following. That is speed, the productivity. And I think that that is where 3D printing maybe, maybe seemed to promise a lot, but in practice, it is quite difficult to find the right business case because it is taking a lot of time to put each layer there. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do that with a certain accuracy with a heavy robot arm, and it will be heavy because your, your printing head is a heavy one in, 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 in building and construction because yeah, there is concrete and it's, it's heavy. So how to get the right accuracy? Uh, in combination with high productivity and high productivity means speed mm -hmm. and if you go to higher speeds the accuracy uh, locally goes goes uh, down whole ball game of course is accuracy oh, sorry versus speed. so as professor uh, steinbuck was stating there's this interplay between size accuracy and speed which means that essentially uh, ideally what we would want to do is to minimize our printhead mass so in scale up, we want to satisfy the processing requirements while minimizing printhead mass. And again, looking at our uh, our diagram of a printhead, we can see that there are three major parts contributing to the mass of it. There's the mass of the concrete inside the printhead. There's the mass of the the uh, reaction vessel or the mixing vessel itself, and then there's the mass of the motor used in an active mixing printhead. These two components depend on the concrete volume, so how much concrete you have in the mass, as well as mechanical forces. And this mass depends primarily on the mixing power. And then when we do this mixing, so mixing power, what is that and how do we determine it? Well, it's dependent on two dimensions, dimensionless numbers primarily. One is the power number, uh, and the other is the, rent, the mixing Reynolds number. We already talked about the mixing Reynolds number. Uh, the power number is a number that you can maybe consider as is relating uh, the quantity of a uh, like an impeller uh, drag force, for example, uh, to the amount of uh, of energy required to turn the uh, to turn the uh, impeller. Uh, basically, however, when we look at the uh, power number, uh, it's uh, or the this relationship between power number and Reynolds number, we can see that. There is a, uh, this is a log log plot, I would point out, where there is a decreasing relationship in the amount of power required with increasing uh, Reynolds number uh, in the laminar region and in the turbulent region, it is independent. But for concrete pro uh, mixing processes, it's almost always a, uh, a laminar relationship, or it's a laminar, uh, laminar mixing process which means that it tends to follow this relationship here where, where the power is equal to a laminar power constant times the viscosity of your material uh, times the square of the impeller speed. And there is the, uh, the length scale as well, which you can uh, equate to a volume. Um, essentially, then what that means is that our mass of our printed is dependent on the one hand on the volume of our printhead, a volume of our mixing vessel, let's say, and then the other hand, the motor is dependent on that volume as well as actually your impeller speed and your viscosity. And through this analysis, then you can make a few guesses or predictions using our ETH Zurich printhead 
uh, we can see, first of all, that the majority of the printed mass is actually in the vessel components, at least, uh, but that's probably because we're over-designed. So uh, we probably could do some uh, optimization of our mechanical engineering design of our print heads. Uh, and what we can see also is that with increasing flow rates, you can either increase the speed at which you turn, that's what this line here is, or you can increase, uh, uh, or you, that's what this line here is, where we keep the volume the same and pump faster and mix faster, or you can increase the volume and keep the speed the same, which uh, is this linear relationship here, which means implies that we should scale up our printheads by simply mixing at higher speeds. However, only if the viscosity is low enough. We can see that if we change the viscosity, then this relationship shows a very strong uh, dependence uh, and meaning that you need higher mixing powers with higher viscosities, which makes, uh, which makes sense. And it increases, of course, with the square of that speed. So what's interesting here to point out is that typically for concretes, we see a, about an order of magnitude increase in viscosities compared to mortars. And so this is uh, seemingly saying that if we increase our, uh, our coarse aggregate size or our aggregate size to coarse aggregates, then we might be running into problems of higher mixing powers in these active mixing printheads. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, then I'll just uh, conclude this talk. First of all, uh, by revisiting the statements uh, that, that were made earlier uh, with respect to mixes not being sustainable, uh, it's important to note, I think, that digital fabrication's only unique benefit is coming from shape efficiency, uh, but uh, we still should and try, and, and people are doing this actually, uh, to get our printed concrete as close as possible to, to standard concrete. So I think there's actually a very strong economic incentive to move in that direction. So I'm, I'm confident uh, that we'll get there through clinker substitutions, uh, possibly the use of alternative binders, as well as increasing aggregate size. And there's a lot of benefits that come from increasing aggregate size. So I think we really have to move as a field towards there. Um, on the second statement, there hasn't yet been a building size structure printed in one go. Um, I think, uh, well, I hope I've demonstrated that it's going to be a, a lot easier to do this with 2K systems rather than 1K systems. Uh, but uh, across wide areas, we need some scale up and scale up principles to be applied. Uh, and uh, one of those that we looked at in the paper has to do with uh, what happens to our printhead when we need to increase uh, our flow rate and go to higher aggregate sizes. Uh, in that case, uh, we see that lower viscosities favor lower mixing power. So I think uh, the best thing we can do is to develop shear thinning and well-graded materials just to, just to lower that required mixing power. Uh, and uh, there's also really a lot of room for improvement in reducing mass and the vessel components. Uh, so uh, as I stated before, a lot that we can do with mechanical engineering design. Oh, well, I'd like to acknowledge all the uh, folks, my co-authors, of course, as well as many people in, uh, in Switzerland and other institutions who have supported uh, the funding, of course, provided by the Swiss National Science Foundation and the NCCR. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>